I remember also <laughs> getting off the bike and pushing the bike with my uh, with my hands and the, the coach screaming like, get back on the bike, <laughs> what are you doing? It was something that I like was pushing people to change to the better is one of the goals I have in life. I would assume that the hijab stands out in the peloton, right? Like it's probably yeah, not something that it's common for them. Especially on hot days, especially on hot days. <laughs> Everybody yeah. is looking at me like, how do you even cope like that? Uh, the national team to the Asian Championships and I was able to achieve the first um, medal for the UAE on the Asian level. Beyond the Olympics, what are some of your biggest dreams in this sport? Become world champion, maybe? Like I say it with hesitation, but I'd love to say it with more confidence. Hello and welcome to Opton, a podcast series from the National News dedicated to Arab athletes and their respective journeys towards the Paris 2024 Olympics. I'm your host, Rima Boulil, and today I'm joined by the UAE's first female professional cyclist, Safiya Sawyer. A multiple-time national champion and a time trial bronze medalist at the under-23 Asian Championships, Safiya has made rapid strides in the sport within a very short period of time. In 2022, she signed for Team UAE ADQ, to become the first Arab woman to join a World Tour outfit. She made her World Tour competitive debut last year with an impressive top 35 finish at the Tour of Chongmeng Island in China. She has represented the UAE in two World Championships and having punched her ticket to Paris this summer, Safiya has become the first Emirati woman cyclist to qualify for the Olympics. As she gets ready to graduate from the American University in Dubai with a degree in graphic design this spring, Safiya discusses the challenges of juggling her cycling career with her studies, what it's been like taking the leap towards competing among the sports elite, her perspective on chasing goals versus dreams, and getting out of a dark hole that almost stopped her from accepting the contract with Team UAE ADQ. She shares her pride in representing her country and religion in the world of professional cycling, and tells us what it's like donning the hijab and competing amongst the predominantly European peloton. She's only just 22 and has already accomplished so much. Join us on this very special episode to find out more about Safiya. Safiya Sawyer, I am very, very happy that you're joining me today in today's episode of Abtal. Thank you so much for your time. I've been wanting to talk to you for a very long time. I've been following your career. I love following you on Instagram because you always go to very cool cafes and I, cafes that I've never heard of. <laughs> so I get all my new recommendations from you. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and yeah, welcome to Optal. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. And uh, I look forward to this uh, episode. So um, you have a big year ahead of you. You're graduating from the American University in Dubai. You're studying graphic design, I believe. And also, there's just that small thing called the Olympics. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so so there's a lot to discuss, but tell me, let's start with the Olympics. Um, I know it was a goal for you. And when exactly did you know that you officially qualified for the Olympics? And what was your reaction? Uh, obviously, so many emotions. Uh, it's, uh, the Olympics is such a thing. Every, well, I'd say nearly every athlete uh, dreams of at least participating in and the whole experience. Um, I think I'm more forward to the whole experience more than the race I'm going to race. Uh, obviously, the race is going to be brutal. Uh, it's the Olympics, so one of the hardest races uh, on an athlete's calendar and all the best of names. And then you have uh, every four years, obviously, is the Olympics. So the year before it, which was last year qualifying, uh, was such a, well, athletes are on nearly the top level to qualify but then on the year of the olympics they're on an even higher level so you just don't even know what to how much more to ex to expect from the worldwide level um or at, le um, at least for cycling to speak in specific and uh, i look forward to the brutal experience with the race but also the I'm sure it's going to be such an enjoyable and memorable experience all around being in the athlete village with all the different athletes. I always enjoy going with the Olympic committee to any games. So we've had the Arab games, we've had the Islamic games, we've had uh, also the Asian games last year and the year before all postponed because of COVID. And I really got to enjoy because it was the first uh, year to participate ever, like ever since I've started my career in any type of games with different athletes. So 
so different than just having cyclists around you because year by year, okay, you do get new faces, but then uh, you still have quite a lot of athletes that you already know. So you don't get to mix and network with other sports and different athletes. So how did you qualify for this? Uh, because I know with cycling, there's different things and you can go through continental and things like that. So how did you qualify? Yeah. So for in cycling, you get to either qualify by your continental championship, which for me is the Asian championship. Uh, but uh, back in uh, June, uh, I was fifth in the TT and then I had an unfortunate, um, I'd say not best decision in the last corner of the race. And I missed out on a good result on the road race. Uh, so I wasn't able to qualify directly through that championship because I think it's only first and second that qualify. I'm for sure now that first qualifies, but I'm not sure. Some years it's been second, some years not. Um, but uh, yeah, I was 20 something in that race. So yeah, quite unfortunate. Like I was looking for a goal there, but uh, didn't achieve it. But then I still got points out of that continental championships have actually are quite rich in points so uh, I was able to achieve some points there also before going to the so after not qualifying in the Asian championships I had to change or at least try to achieve as many points in all the races I do throughout the calendar uh, so after the continental championships there wasn't uh, well we were we weren't so optimistic with uh, qualifying because um, you know, all the countries are doing very high World Tour races. I only got into the World Tour races at the end of the season to achieve a bit more points through that. But if an athlete is uh, competing at World Tour levels, which is the highest league of cycling, um, you're getting quite a lot of points from each race you win or at least get a top 40 in. So nations then, we uh, by mid-year, we... Um, we changed the plan with qualifying by points and trying to achieve as many. And then it was quite late because there was not many races left. So um, I was still able to achieve some. And we decided to qualify by, try and qualify by nation ranking. Um, and that's how we qualified in the end and got one place in the Olympics as a nation. And uh, through Asian Games, through um, the world, first World Tour race I did and debuted in uh, China, I was, well, both races actually were in China. So we I had a big block in China. Uh, first going for the Asian Games with the time trial, I was able to achieve a couple of points. I achieved about 30 points in the road race, ranking in the top 20. And then I was able to also achieve some good points in the tour of uh, Chongming Island in Shanghai, uh, China. And by that, uh, we were able to um, at least save the spot that we had kind of lost in the Asian Games because more riders were getting more and more points. Um, so yeah, we were able to save the spot and just get into that uh, end point of the nation ranking and qualify with one place. And I got the qualification ended in the, I think around the 17th of October. And then we got the final actual results around the end of, uh, well, 17th to 18th of November. And that's when I was driving with my mom back from the FBMA awards. And uh, we got the news and I was just full of emotions. So, yeah, it's been such a dream uh, to, well, to dream about uh, going to the Olympics. But then uh, to actually qualify is something else. Uh, such a goal come true. It sounded like that uh, period of end of last year was quite stressful. Was it stressful and looking at the points the whole time and all that? It was. It was and then you have the database not being always updated so you're always waiting uh, to see if any other nations have actually scored more points to jump above you uh, so yeah it was a bit stressful uh, but we just took it uh, race by race uh, trying to achieve the maximum and uh, I'm very very happy and blessed and thanks to god that I was able to qualify. Well that's amazing um, let's go back to the beginning I know that you you started with many different sports before settling on cycling. Can you tell me a little bit mm -hmm. about your background in sport and eventually what did lead you to cycling? So I come from quite a, I'd say a sporty household. Uh, my father was an ex-professional footballer and uh, he actually competed at the Junior World Cup, which is a big thing for football as well. So I'm happy to also achieve big things uh, like he has achieved. 
and uh, he push- well he didn't push us technically into sports but he was he was happy with us competing at uh, different uh, th- various types of sports at school uh we had back in my age we had so many competitions throughout the year and i was all co- always called the sporty girl because i was going for everything and being pushed into everything by the um, pe teachers and uh, i did all sorts i did rugby i did all the basketball football um uh, um rugby badminton tennis uh swimming i used to be i really used to love swimming and i thought it was something that i well i did settle on it for four years competing in the school uh league uh but uh obviously with covering up and with uh, uh my father not being so keen on me competing outside of the school uh level back at the time because of my studies um i limited myself and then there wasn't that age category above uh, i think 12 years old back in the school league so i was i had to leave that dream on the side and go and compete in different other sports i really was, was quite saddened um it's like uh, giving up on your favorite sport was quite a, quite a sad thing for me but uh i guess uh, you only give up things to go to better stuff uh, in the future and I'm happy to I, I did also gymnastics actually and I'd say swimming and gymnastics are two sports that have given me a big uh, level up in cycling because of the flexibility and um, also the fitness swimming gives you and the flexibility of uh, gymnastics um, like gives me a bit more elasticity and uh, a bit of an advantage of uh, others who are not so flexible uh, obviously cycling is such an endurance sport but for the small details around uh, the position and being able to hold it and things like that I was able uh, I'd say to get an advantage from um, uh, from the sports uh, I competed in at a young age I got pushed I was doing athletics after swimming which I wasn't so keen on um, but I was doing it because there were more competitions for it and I was like okay I always have to go have a go at uh any other sport I haven't tried out so I was trying it out and I got introduced to cycling through first of all through school there was a Dubai amateur well Dubai um the Dubai tour amateur race uh I wanted to compete in because I had uh, bought a secondhand bicycle with my father both me and him were going around the neighborhood and had like enjoying just cycling after a busy day we got to bond even more uh go onto a deeper level of uh um, not just a uh, father to really daughter relationship, but actually uh, be more as friends and share more and, you know, a better level of closeness. And uh, it's really memories to actually cherish and uh, remember on throughout my life, which is something also I want to do with my children, hopefully in the future. Um, if I'm blessed with any, uh, to actually connect with them even uh, deeper. And through there, I didn't get to race that race eventually, but uh, I also, from my friend in athletics I uh, saw her actually uh, taking pictures and posting on social media of the UA Cycling Federation and back in the time it was such a small sport that for women especially that there was only the national team out there competing Uh, there were no amateur teams as we have today there were no uh, club uh, club teams other than for the male category Um, and now we have also the first professional team which is uh, such an honor and such a um a good direction for people to look up to uh to dream of uh the professional dream so yeah i got into cycling by joining the national team my father wasn't so keen as i told you because he didn't like me doing sports out uh, the out of the school boundary uh, for the sake of my studies um he did give up a bit of his studies for some time for his dream of becoming a professional uh so but i, I was an a student i was focused in my studies and i didn't i i did want to continue with my studies and also do uh, sport at a more professional level or you know progress with it more out of school and uh, I was happy that he eventually was uh, convinced and he allowed me to do it and yeah and then it, it went uh, it got better year by year more races more um, community initiatives amateur teams came up clubs came up uh, clubs started creating a women's team when they already had a male's team and uh, up from there, it just progressed to today with the, well, first with the first uh, professional male team and then now for the female with UA Team ADQ. That's amazing. And with, with your father, obviously him being an athlete, 
it, it's interesting that in your case, in the beginning, him being a former athlete who uh, had to give up his studies made him not want you to be an, a professional athlete. But then that seemed to have changed with time. What, what, do you remember a certain moment where you felt, okay, my dad's like backing me now and he's okay with this and he's proud of what I'm doing and all that? Was there a specific moment you felt that made a difference? Well, actually, in the beginning, uh, I joined on like the second semester of my ninth grade. Um, so I was able to prove to him as soon as I finished that semester that already uh, I was already achieving the same grades I was. And I actually even got better a bit. So he was really happy that I even improved even more. And I do say that, like, you know, sports help you, helps you you know, think better, function better. So it was such a, I'd say, a improvement for that statement and to prove to him that I was still focused and I I was able to balance between both. Uh, at that point, uh, he felt more reassured. And also after graduating from school, because school is quite, okay, uni is stressful. <laughs> Out of experience, it is stressful, but school, um, school days are really long. So you have to fit in training after school, then you have no time for, you know, homework. I was just cobbling homework around in breaks and then, uh, you know, before going to class and stuff like that. So I was able to balance it out and felt that he was really reassured. There was one point in my, my career before becoming a professional that I wanted to give up because uh, of after getting COVID and losing the fitness. Um, but uh, he's the one that actually said, no, we should keep on going. And I was actually, it was a point that I was actually quite surprised to, uh, okay, I already saw him supporting me, but to, for him to actually say, no, you should keep it on going and it's going to get better. Uh, it was a really good point to have his support uh, because uh, at points like that, you can't think straight and it's really good to have the, the other people's support with the right mindset. Yeah. So you pretty much got into the sport at 14 if i'm not mistaken yes. that's kind of yeah, when you yeah. when you joined the national team and stuff and uh-huh. then before you you got your professional contract in 2022 but bef- that period was there a moment when you started really understanding oh you can actually be a professional cyclist and it became a goal for you or was it also gradual that you never even put it as a goal uh well, every uh, athlete, I think, wants to become a professional uh, if they want to progress in the sport they are competing in. Okay, I compete at the national, uh, international level with the national team, but it's also nice to be in the professional league as well, you know, with uh, racing against um, other teams and not just uh, nations, um, with a collective of mixes of nations, you know, because say our team has like, uh, I think, around 14 uh, nationalities in the same or th- 12 to 14 nationalities in the same team so you get to mix and match and uh, you know converse and share ideas so that's also one aspect of being in such a you know a different league than just your national team with the same riders uh, or the same nationality um so well getting into the well getting that contract was uh, quite not surprising but it was such a such a good opportunity um and it was something like wow I'm already becoming a professional like I wouldn't have expected to become if, if I were to become a professional in my career I don't think I didn't never think I would become professional that early I mean it's still eight like seven you know when was it six years later after start, uh, starting but uh, with us well this sport being such a new sport in my nation I did not think to become uh um a professional this early in my career so i read actually that you were considering of turning it down because of you touched on that saying it was quite a difficult period for you before then Mm -hmm. i read somewhere you actually described that period as a dark hole if you don't if you don't mind elaborating a bit because i think people would uh, would find this very inspiring that you went from really probably considering Mm -hmm. turning down that contract and feeling really low why Why were you in that quote-unquote dark hole? So uh, I had a period where I was away for a long time with the national team to compete in the Arab Championships. I came back, I had a jumble lot of university work. I studied graphic design, so it's a major where you have to put a lot of work into um, a creating. And, you know, if you get a creative blog as well, it's so hard to get past it. So 
I was also a creative block at that point. Uh, so I was making everything harder. I wasn't able to uh, finish up uh, projects and um, work that I had pending, you know, because I had left for a good three weeks. Um, and that uni three weeks means a lot in a compact uh, um, semester. Uh, so yeah, it was, I was already very high on pressure from university coming back. Um, and then um, I also was followed by, okay, finals <laughs> after finishing all that lot of work. So finals put a lot of stress on me, not being able to train as frequently. So that first week coming back was a whole week off the bike. With the bike, two, three days, you feel already so bad coming back. Um, so after a week already, it was really bad coming back I wasn't able to train as well that properly with the finals so it was a day two days off uh, two days of riding uh, and then trying to squabble around with the workload and finally after I had uh, finished the semester that weekend I was like finally I'm back to training I got COVID and uh, had to at home for another week so it was nearly a whole month of squabbling training and not the best training and then not no training at all for a couple of weeks so I had already gotten the opportunity to become a professional cyclist at that time but things were not looking bright getting back on the bike after that whole period uh, obviously the bike uh, the my body was loaded also with stress that I needed to release after that period um, I also was so low on fitness after after such uh, things happening. Uh, the mind was uh, very down. So I, all those uh, elements contributed into not such a bright aspect uh, inside my head. And uh, it was uh, it was hard. I had an opportunity to join the first training camp with the team, and my that's where my father was pushing me. He was like, "Go enjoy. It's in Spain. You have nice weather. You have uh, you, you're gonna get to meet the whole team." And he kept pushing me. He also went with me to that training camp. Um, he was always with me um, back in the years when I recall all my moments with cycling. He also used to take me to to everyday training for like three day, for three years. So he really has um, put in a lot of effort and time to support such things. And in that period, dark period. And uh, yeah, like getting back to training, uh, like I said, was very dark. Uh, it was so hard to see myself as nearly a beginner in fitness. Again, you lose fitness with cycling very fast. So that's really something that contributed to feeling so low um, and that I'd lost, you know, a lot that I've, I had worked on the whole year. And uh, yeah, I just had to keep believing. Uh, our team slogan actually this year is to believe. And uh, at that period, I really needed that slogan. Just keep believing and uh, working towards uh, a better, you know, perspective and uh, fitness. And the the point that got me out of that black point, okay, I did have enjoy the time with uh, the team in Spain, but uh, a month later, I went, or actually two months later, I went with uh, the national team to the Asian Championships and I was able to achieve the first um, medal for the UAE on the Asian level. And that really had me on the clouds. It was something I'd never expected, especially in those circumstances. And it was what gave me the light to see better opportunities ahead. That was the under 23 time trial, right? You got bronze? Yeah, it was, okay. it was, yeah. So w tell me more about why did it mean for you so much to get that medal? Because I know that like you probably getting into the sport, you could see like Yusuf Merza uh, doing so mm -hmm. well on the Asian level and all that. And, so, and, and within a very short period of time, you're a you were able to do it. So I'm just wondering wh what it meant to you. Oh, it really meant a lot, especially, you know, because I was in that dark period. So uh, it meant opportunity, more opportunities ahead. If I had achieved uh, with such circumstances an Asian medal, then what can I achieve with even better preparation, with uh, uh, better opportunities, with better periods, with a better head? Um, what would I be able to achieve? So it really, if I can summarize it, it that win was... Well, it was a win for me, even though it was a bronze, it was not <laughs> uh, gold. But for me, it meant uh, opportunities ahead, uh, if I would summarize it. And it was so it was lovely to stand finally on the, 
the Asian podium and to dream for better results ahead. So the joining um, UAE team ADQ, uh, the first Emirati women's professional team at that level on the world tour, that's a big leap for anyone in general to go. <laughs> and But for you, in like, again, because of in this part of the world, the, the sport is not necessarily at the most professional level and it's rapidly mm -hmm. improving. Mm -hmm. You go from, you, your start is with the national team, which isn't necessarily the path that someone in a different country would have because, you know, you yeah. would, you would exactly. work your way up to a national team and then mm -hmm. you would work your way up to a world tour, you know, to a world team. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like to be thrust into that? Because even if you weren't in a dark period, even if you were in your best, going into it probably there there are some doubts of wow this is such a big leap how am I going to bridge that gap so how how did you go about the, the mindset of handling something like that so I uh, already had uh, as we come in as a national team at the international level racing at uh, Asian championships or uh, Arab championships already okay and the Arab championships Um, I was able to progress well when be one of the top, uh, alhamdulillah, at the moment for the past couple of years. Uh, but then on the Asian level, we also had such a big gap to close. And so already I had that uh, expectation that I'm going to have to, um, you know, be subtle with myself, with the head of... Uh, not stressing too much that, okay, I'm at the level when the rest of the team or the rest of the world's at a different level. The the, the level gap uh, between the Middle East and uh, Europe and the rest of the Western world is a big, big gap. And um, I take it uh, with optimism that uh, being able, well, a challenge to close that gap. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm the person trying to, well, we have a lot of uh, Arab couple of Arab girls uh, also doing the same uh, and I'm proud of them and I'm proud to race with them as well. Uh, we have a couple that actually became professional also last year at the different uh, professional levels. So it's nice to see that uh, there are also other ladies with me on the same way uh, trying to uh, shorten and um, accelerate our progress as a nation and uh, our side of the world to the other um, really high level. And, uh, okay, it was big. I felt like it was really big responsibility on my uh, shoulders, but also a really big uh, opportunity, even though it was a challenge, a big opportunity for me to prove that and uh, for me to be able to do, to do that uh, for the rest of uh, the upcoming generations. I'm wondering, do you ever look at it also in a way that as much as you are learning from this experience and there's a lot to take from your teammates, the team, the whole experience is everything, You're also bringing a lot to the table because they've never had a teammate like you and they can get to learn new things as well. Do you ever, are you able to look at it that way as well? And what do you think you're bringing to, you can, you can bring to the team and to, to be competing with a team like that? The first thing I see, not just in my team, but to the whole world is, uh, well, hopefully, and I always try to, um, Uh, to bring this to the table, that to represent um, my first, first of all, my religion and my nation uh, in the best way possible to represent it around the world, um, from, to show that okay, my nation is not like many expect it to be, um, or have known it to be, and uh, that my religion uh, also is um, something that doesn't constrain me, uh, but uh, also gives me the opportunity to. Uh, to do such and uh, yeah I just try to represent uh, well I, I take it as an opportunity to show people the true side of both you know religion and uh, nation uh, so many have uh, lots of stereo well not uh, not from the team but from the whole world we have lots of uh, people having so many stereotypes about uh, the Arab and Muslim world so it's nice to be able to sometimes prove the opposite and hopefully prove uh, prove it to be better than what they expect it to be so yeah i mean you made your european debut last year in poland i think yes and, i did and and then you made the world tour debut in china so yeah. i would assume that the hijab stands out in the peloton 
right? Like it's probably yeah, not something that it's common for them. Especially on hot days. Especially on hot days. Exactly. Everybody is looking at me like, how do you even cope like that? <laughs> I'm like, uh, well, it's it's the way of. Uh, I took my first uh, bike bicycle ride and how I how I train and how I have how I have been up to today. So I've never known it to be differently, and uh, I'm not uh, I'm not that. Uh, well, I'm not sad to be racing this way. Uh, I'm happy to be represent, representing myself and um, my, um, I'd say, uh, my way of living. Yeah. I think it's also going to be a very, a very significant moment for you, I think, when you go to Paris, because in France, end of last year, they passed a law banning hijab in sports in France, which affected so many people who live in France and are professional athletes and wear the hijab. A lot of footballers had to leave and stuff like that. Obviously, in the Olympics, they're not banning the hijab because it's different. But I, I feel like it would make a very big impact for the French public to just see all all these hijabi athletes just doing their thing and competing and doing amazing. How do you see that element of of your participation? Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully, me and my uh, sisters in religion are able to uh, add a statement in Paris in the Olympics uh, to show that. Uh, it's not restricting us in any way and that we are able to compete or even compete better than a lot, um, uh, even with uh, our dressing and with uh, whatever we take from our religion. So I think, uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely a big statement uh, to the world and to the French people. And uh, hopefully we can represent our hijab and our religion in the best way. Yeah. So uh, with cycling, a lot of the cyclists in Europe grow up riding in the mountains every day because they have access to it or and all of that and obviously in the UAE most of the training you would do is flat unless you have to travel to go to to climb you know mm-hmm. so how mm-hmm. how tricky is that part and and how has your evolution been in terms of because you need to know how to climb even if you're not going to be a specialized climber it's part, it's a very important part and i think probably the downhills are even scarier because when i'm watching it, it looks super scary so <laughs> can you tell me first of all the do you remember the first time you you had to face like a very daunting climb or a very daunting downhill and how did you deal with it uh i do have i do have memories of going to the mountains actually on my second week as a cyclist with the national team preparing for the first races we had and it was back in uh, back in 2016, going up to Fajera with the bike, and uh, they were quite hard. We do have quite hard climbs here in the country. It's just you don't have that many. And uh, yeah, the uphills were brutal, especially um, riding with girls who already had experience and were riding for a while. Um, it was quite daring and. Uh, I remember also <laughs> getting off the bike and pushing the bike with my uh, with my hands and the the coach screaming like get back on the bike <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> it's such a such a memory and to cherish and remember um going high and high with sports and having many more climbs and uh yeah you do need a lot of uh mountain training even if like you said, you don't. You've done good research, even if you don't want to be a good cli- like a, the best of climber. Um, so you need the momentum on the climb to be able to pedal in the right way, uh, efficiently pushing the power in the right with the right muscles uh, to be able to conquer the mountain uh, in the best of ways. Uh, so definitely, training on mountains is a important aspect. Um, I don't, well, you do need to do mountains. I try to go as much um, or as many days of the year be in Europe uh, to train for some bigger races. I've had the opportunity to be in Europe with uh, my UAE team ADQ for two summers. So also get away from the heat, the scorching heat here, even though Europe is not so pleasant these days. Um, But uh, to climb mountains nearly every day and get more elevation into my rides. Uh, when I'm in the country, if I do have important events, I try to go as much as possible to Jabal Jais, Jabal Hafid, Hatta with some hills, more consistent hills. Um, but it's also a challenge, like you said, to travel. It's at least an hour travel one way. So that adds another two two hours, two hours and a half of traveling, sometimes four hours if you're going even further to Jais. Um, traveling and then you also have to do a long bike ride because the bike rides these days at the professional level 
Uh, you don't just do an hour or two. Sometimes you're doing up to five or six hours on the bike, depending on the volume you're and the race you're training for. So that's a big block to be able to travel there, to already have the fatigue of sitting in the car for an hour or two and driving using one leg. You know, one leg is rested, one leg is pressing on the brake and the um and on the accelerator so yeah it uh, it is uh, a challenge but then i'm always happy to be in europe to be able to uh, climb nearly every day and be consistent with it and i really see after a week or two of doing more con- more climbs i do get better and better so i couldn't imagine actually um having a climb next to me and climbing it uh, every day how much difference that would make so definitely training with climbs makes a difference but when I don't have the climbs, I try to use uh, the headwind. We have quite a lot of headwind here in the UAE, even though it's flat. So the headwind always adds a bit of uh, uncomfortable conditions uh, on the bike. So you always have to push through it and it doesn't make you stronger. There's always a quote I recall is that when it's uh, when you have headwind, it makes you stronger. When it's behind you, it makes you faster. <laughs> and I like that quote. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wa- when I would watch the, because I covered the first when it was the Dubai tour and then UAE tour, I've covered it quite a bit. And I would mm-hmm. see the cyclists in the desert and the, the sand is coming from one side and all this. That In general, watching the sport, even when I when I had to like cover just right through the television, the Tour de France or the Vuelta de España or the Giro, you some of those stages you finish like you're, there's crazy ascents and then mm-hmm. cobblestones suddenly appear and rain. And it's it looks when you're watching, why would anyone do that to themselves? <laughs> and I really, how do you prepare your mind for any of these? Con- I'm not even saying all these conditions together. I'm just saying, how do you prepare your mind for that kind of grueling? Because the stage races as well, these stages can be like 200 kilometers each and stuff like that. How do you train your mind for that? So definitely endurance sports needs a lot of not just physical ability, but mental ability as well. And being tough in the brain, in the in the mind, I'd say, not even in the brain. Because uh, with fatigue and with all the lactate and pushing for long hours or even, like you said, various days, uh, does have you at one point wanting to give up on yourself. Uh, what makes us do it? I'm not sure <laughs> because it does seem I don't I don't see my I don't take myself as a as a sane person <laughs> doing this sport. Uh, I'm definitely insane with the uh, the the levels of pro cycling and how how far and deep it takes you into your body uh, and mind. Um, so yeah, I, I have actually my past twenty twenty three year uh, was. Uh, a year that I actually dedicated to building mental toughness. And as I put that goal at the the beginning of the year, suddenly so many people, so many topics were attracted to me by that energy uh, of setting that uh, intention of becoming stronger in that way. I got introduced to um, a mental toughness uh, coach. I got introduced to to, well, I got to um, meet a friend that was actually working on the same uh, goal of uh, becoming mentally tougher. Uh, I was. I also dedicated my senior project uh, at university through design to that certain uh, topic as well. We had the uh, change as a theme, and I, I made my change through uh, mental toughness and changing your physical psyche. Oh, sorry, your me- your psyche uh, to become stronger through sports and especially for endurance athletes. I made a whole kit with a diary to change vocab that you use to change uh, uh, the way you think. And it was mainly called, it's called Project Evolve. And it, um, its slogan is conquer from within. So how to conquer the outside from your inside. And uh, it had a main statement of how are you speaking to yourself? So definitely the way you speak to yourself, you have 30,000 thoughts uh, a day going through your brain. Um, with the research, they've seen uh, 30,000 thoughts. And imagine if uh, 80, 90 percent of those thoughts are bad thoughts a day. We're only sitting inside um, something that stops us rather than makes us evolve. So the whole project intended to change that and uh, be able to change at least one percent 
well, hope for one percent daily, um, and uh, record all of those thoughts and start changing them through actually writing them out. Because you can think a thought, but actually writing the thought out also is very different. Uh, it uh, you know turns on different wirings in your brain, and it helps you um, become uh, well alter alter it. Um, to become better so yeah with all those attractions it was so fascinating through the months for finding out more and get meeting other people so it was definitely something that even showed me that setting an intention brings a lot more difference than uh, just thinking it out or saying okay I want to uh, um, I want to become stronger or evolve with this but not actually setting that proper intention um, so definitely it's something I'd recommend uh, people out there for mental toughness is uh, to actually start listening to the way you speak to yourself because the way you speak to yourself um, um, changes your perspective and um, also, well, if you speak better to yourself, you help yourself perform even better as in if we're talking about it from the um, uh, physical and athletic uh, side. Um, and I was happy to also inspire along the way lots of other different students around in uni and professors. Uh, so it's always something that I like was pushing people to change to the better is one of the goals I have in life. I love that so much. And I love that you are, have found a way or are always finding ways now to combine your two, the two big parts of your life, which is cycling and design. Uh, it's in very creative ways and I'm wondering if that's something you want to continue doing definitely that's the touch point I'm coming up to uh, well towards too soon uh, I graduate in May uh, we're now in uh, February uh, finally coming to uh, an end with my uh, uni uh, journey and uh, what well a goal I have is to combine the my designing skills and experience in design uh, with uh, the sports industry if I can go with cycling I'd be more than happy uh, but uh, definitely in the sports industry to design stuff for it uh, would be a goal I have and it, which is uh, what I'm working on now with my portfolio course to uh, get ready a file to introduce to the uh, sports industry uh, with designing. I love that so you I read somewhere and you did touch upon it that you're a bit of an introvert but your sport requires you to travel the whole world, go to places you've never been, work in a team, have teammates from different countries, all of that. How did you go from being a, an introvert to being able to do that and actually thrive in that environment? What's What was that evolution like for you? So I'd still say inside I'm a bit of an introvert, extrovert, <laughs> because my sport requires me, like you said, to travel, speak to people, to network. Uh, all the opportunities I'm getting, uh, possibly with uh, the team, are uh, making me step out of the, those boundaries I had or limits I had to myself and the shyness. So year by year, I've been doing more interviews. I've been doing meeting more people, traveling more. So it's all stepping on me, making me step on that line, and making that limit even wider, pushing me to interact with people. So I'd say that the sport and it pushing me to do that uh, has uh, helped me evolve in that aspect. And also, if I were to speak in general, sports um, does make does change you into a different person. So sports itself is the main thing that has well pushed me to change. Uh, and I, I'm very happy with the stuffy I am today. Uh, definitely want to evolve and push for more and um, become a better person uh, out there in the world. But uh, uh, definitely, I do love the progress uh, I've seen in myself through sports and how much I have changed through it. That's awesome. Um, there are a few milestones, I guess, uh, like the, the medal in the Asian uh, championship. And then you, I, I want to particularly ask you about your world tour debut uh, in China. Because that that was your first experience at the highest level in the sport, I would say, be, besides the world championship, because that's a bit different. Uh, mm -hmm, so yeah. I'd like to speak about both. But your first world championship, I think you've been to two now. Um, yes. And uh, so so what was the first world championship like? And then what was your world team, world tour de debut like? So world championships are quite brutal, I'd say. Um, as brutal as cycling gets, that's even a different uh, story because... 
uh, with World Championships, you have all the athletes coming at their best shape or form, or hopefully come th- hoping that they come with the best form. So, and it's a one day race, uh, quite a long one day race, uh, normally over 140 kilometers with either hard climbs or hard parkour um, or challenging ones like a lot of turns, which I normally don't race with. So Wollongong last year racing my first world championships uh, was hard. Uh, I didn't even get to finish the race. Uh, It was that hard. And uh, let me just sorry to interrupt. But so people know, I think about like 48 riders of the 120 who started or something like that didn't yeah, finish. Not so, many, not many yeah. finished. Actually, uh, I think it was just over 70 riders and we were 140 riders. It was about that amount. So like nearly half of the peloton didn't finish that race. It was a very hard course. And uh, the city circuit was even more challenging. I saw lots of World Tour riders even pull out of uh, that race. So I really got to understand like, Okay, uh, I am at a development point in my life, but uh, even the best of the best uh, were struggling in that race and only pushes me to, you know, to fight more, to achieve uh, that level and better. And then, well, that that race was with an invitation and I was very happy to actually qualify this year to the World Championships, uh, which is another milestone in my career that I cherish. And uh, this year it was in Glasgow, another brutal circuit in the city especially. Um, and everybody just comes at full gas and they're going full gas from the beginning. So <laughs> really, really is hard to race in the world championships because everybody wants that world title. I mean, what can you have other than the Olympic dream? What can you have better than becoming world champion for a whole season um, and having that on your CV of an athlete? Um, and then my debut with, uh, but yeah, like after world championships last year, I made it a goal that, Next year, when I uh, participate in world championships, I'm sure it's not going to be that much easier, but uh, I'm going to try and at least get even further into the race with the main protagonist to be able to show myself that, okay, through a year, I have um, achieved progress. And I really was happy with my performance. I didn't have that best of a day on the bike in the world championships, but uh, I really showed myself that I was able to fight so much uh, harder and deeper. Uh, I also showed myself that from the beginning of 23 to the mid of 23, I was able to make at least uh, 20% progress with my mental abilities and strengthen, uh, th- strengthen it throughout those months. Um, not to um, judge myself too early in the race and actually I think it out and, you know, kilo- kilometer by kilometer to see how it goes and not stress about it because stressing about it only takes over your energy that you need need to perform the race um so uh yeah i definitely say i've made progress in so many ways from world championship to another and i look forward to assessing myself again in the world championships this year and also in the olympics as we have that before it and uh my debut with ua me dq in china Definitely was a memorable one. Um, it was uh, lovely to finally be racing on the category my team is part of, uh, and uh, it, it was it was the right I think the right moment to start with it because if I had started any earlier, it would have well as as hard as you think it is, uh, it's always shocking. So to be ready for it is the best option, and the team got me to that point where I was ready to compete and made me compete. Uh, after seeing my results and my uh, performance in Poland and Toscana uh, with the development team. Uh, So I'd say they took me to the right point to actually start that mission on. And uh, I'm happy to also have raced another world to race, uh, well, another two already uh, uh, last month in Australia, which was much harder because of the hills again. Uh, We don't have much of the hilly skills and uh, climbing. So yeah, it was a challenge in Australia, but China was a really good point to debut because it was uh, it had more of the flat parkours and um, more of sprint stages so uh, it was able to suit me as a profile of a rider and I was able to get good uh, good results and also gain some points for the Olympics uh, and that was uh, quite bizarre to actually achieve points and be in the top 40 of uh, world tour uh, stage race uh, from my first participation so it was a milestone again of my career and uh, days that I can look back on to uh, quite happily. But 
That was definitely very impressive. I've I followed I followed your results that week in China. Um, so looking at Paris, in your own eyes, because l- let me brief. I, I read that it's a one hundred and fifty eight kilometer long race uh, mm-hmm. at the Olympics, and there are one thousand seven hundred meters of climbing and nine named ascents. Okay, I'm, I'm sure you know that, but I'm telling people that that's it's it's going to be tricky, and I think they're going to take you up to Montmartre and come back and like because on paper people think oh it's starting at the Trocadero, ending at Trocadero, that's flat. No, it's not. It's going all yeah. around Paris. <laughs> Paris. <laughs> it's so, what would you consider for yourself? What would make it a successful Paris Olympics for you? So uh, lots of people are like uh, have some unrealistic uh, wishes of like ah oh, we have to see you on the podium but that's not that's definitely to be realistic that is not happening uh, with the uh, the level that we are at and the level that the world world is at and I'm already as um, happy with myself for qualifying uh, to the Paris is such a milestone and I'm very happy to be the first ever Marathi woman cyclist to qualify to such a, a big event and um i'd say to make it a successful one for one for me uh would be to complete the race uh already would be such a a big achievement for myself uh because in such races if you get uh, dropped out of the the major peloton and as the race comes to uh, a circuit uh, at the end of it if you are at the back of the race and you're not in the first group most times you're pulled out of the race So actually to be with the first group and to finish it with them would be such a big achievement to me and I'd really be happy with it. Um, so that's what I'm preparing and hoping for and uh, also getting my brain ready to envision it and uh, make it possible. And in terms of the Olympic experience, uh, first of all, have are there any other athletes that you grew up admiring or are inspired by right now, whether in your sport or outside your sport? Yes, Yusuf Mirza, you already touched upon, was a big inspiration for me ever since I joined the national team. Uh, he's been a cyclist that's given up a lot, uh, fell down so many times and got back, uh, had uh, quite brutal injuries uh, and came back even stronger. So such a role model, he also qualified to two editions of the Olympics. Uh, so really uh Uh, an athlete to look up to with uh, all he has done for the cycling in UAE. Uh, he's really had me want to achieve more and more. Uh, he also joined in onto my journey back in uh, 2018 has been, and has been supporting me closely since then. Um, he was coaching me at one point. Uh, he was, uh, he still uh, supports me so much. I race sometimes with the, the Woosh team. So he's the leader of that team. He's also, as he's retired, uh, it was sad to see him retire. Um, but he found that it was the best time for him. And uh, we are happy to have him in a different way as the national team uh, head coach uh, at the moment. So uh, we get to benefit from all that experience and wealthy experience that he has and all the ways to become better as he has become. And uh, hopefully uh, on my side, uh, achieve uh, for the women what he has achieved. And so speaking of Yusuf, because Yusuf was also the first to Emirati to join a world tour team. There's a lot of things that you yeah. are doing now that he was also the first. And I'm curious, Mm -hmm. through your interactions with him, what are some of the things that he told you to kind of uh, deal with being the first, you know, because it's it's something that I would assume probably you feel about it now differently than how it was in the beginning. So how did your mindset change also of of understanding your role as the first and just also accepting Mm -hmm. it, thriving in it? How did Yusuf help you with that? And how do you view that right now? Uh, one thing he told me the other day was that he sees uh, with what I'm going through at the moment, he sees uh, himself in me. And that was, uh, well, quite nice words to hear. If he sees uh, himself in me, that means that uh, hopefully I can have at least a, as a successful career as he uh, has. Um, so, uh, well, he's been supporting very closely. He's always... Uh, offered me what uh, I've been in need for to progress and to um, go even higher. He's uh, provided me with so much of his knowledge of uh, 
you know, what to do in such a hard uh, situations, how to also deal with the sport at uh, such a high level. Because uh, as you progress with the levels of sport, you actually get to experience such new things uh, that you'd never expect to experience. Like I was doing the same I'm I'm riding a bike and I'm doing the same sport as the highest level are doing, but then you get to experience so many different things uh, as you evolve into the higher levels. So he's definitely backed me up and he's envisioned me with uh, what to expect uh, in um, you know this career that I ha- I have and continues to support me. So I'm very um, uh, I feel very blessed with his support and uh, I really appreciate it. Do you follow any other sports or do you do you follow any other athletes in other sports? I used to, well, I, I do follow quite a, co- well, a couple of at least uh, Arab women doing different uh, Emirati athletes and other Arab women doing different sports and uh, they're also inspiring. Another, I say, initiative that has shown me more is the uh, the FBMA Awards. Um, last year, I participated and was shortlisted in, and I got to li- uh, well listen to uh, other Arab athletes speaking about their journey and on the interviews and stuff. And I was really quite fascinated with how many strong athletes we have on the on the international level, and how you sometimes never hear of them which is something I'd like to push with, uh, you know, having more exposure and uh, getting to know more about uh, all the other, at least Arab athletes, you know, before the world, because in the world you have quite a lot of exposure, but then also in like from between male and female, uh, you have such a different in exposure. So always pushing for more uh, exposure for such great achievements to be able to inspire by because sometimes we have the role models but we don't we don't know about them to be inspired by um so getting to know uh, such uh, outstanding uh, names would be definitely a way to inspire many more that's exactly what i'm trying to do also with this podcast is is yeah, exactly what you're saying we have so <laughs> many elite level athletes in different sports but bizarrely we don't know much about them so yeah we have the same uh, vision with that you and i <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely and uh, we appreciate all your efforts thank you I, i'm loving this chat so uh, i'm wondering beyond the olympics what are some of your biggest dreams in this sport in this sport definitely <laughs> as uh, bizarre as it sounds um to become world champion maybe like i say it with hesitation but i'd love to say it with more confidence uh one day to be a world champion and We'll see how the journey takes us uh, if we're able to pursue that uh, dream or not. Uh, but also competing well in the World Championships to be able to, one of my main goals for the coming years, to be able to finish that race in the front group like I want to finish the Olympics uh, would be such a, a good achievement for me because I see how hard it is uh, to be able to win a stage uh, in a stage race would be would be a prominent uh, goal uh, that I would love to achieve. And I'm sure that UAE Team ADQ will back me up and support me in the best way possible to achieve that dream. Uh, a, a short-term dream, I'd say that is more uh, realistic at the time being, would be to win the, already is still so hard, but the Asian Championships, to win that Asian title would definitely be a goal. I don't say a dream because dreams you uh don't you dream of you don't uh, get up to uh, work for and you don't sweat for you don't shed tears and blood for so uh, i call it a dr- uh, i call it a goal because i actually put effort into it and would like to achieve it one day and i always say if something comes true from what i'm working i'm working for i always say what a goal come true and not what a dream come true I love that. I think we have to finish on that note because there is, you said it so perfectly and I totally agree. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I really, really hope you have an amazing Olympic experience. I hope it's what you hope it would be or want it to be. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm definitely going to speak to you again for sure because <laughs> this, was a, this was a very enlightening uh, conversation for me. So thank you, Safaya, so much. Thank you for your time and effort, Reem, and uh, we really appreciate your efforts in uh, giving us more exposure, I'd say. Thank, Thank you. you so it's my it's my honor. <laughs>
<laughs> the pleasure is mine. Thank you. What an incredible conversation with Sofia, who was so open about her journey and the goals she is chasing. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Abdon and stay tuned for a brand new one next week.